This is KTN News. Welcome back to Morning Express. Time now for our newsroom discussion. And this week we are joined in studio by outgoing standard digital editor David Ohito. We also have uh, with us a governance expert Susan Auma and, of course, a cartoonist and a communications consultant Patrick Dara. Many thanks for joining us in studio, gentlemen and lady. And uh, this morning we have a lot to discuss. But let's begin uh, with what uh, the Salaries and Remunerations Commission printed out this week and that's the uh, new revised uh, salary structure for civil servants. Uh, as we speak right now the Kenya Union of Civil Servants has threatened however to stop the implementation of that but Gadara, uh, I don't know if you've seen the new rev uh, the revised structure what are your thoughts on that? Well, actually I haven't seen it so mm -hmm. um, uh, I can't really speak to it uh -huh. um, uh, except to say that um, I think that uh, I mean, we, 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 we're already in a situation where there's lots of labor and rest. Um, and I think we need much more than simply talking about rationalizing salaries, mm -hmm. you know, putting them together and, mm -hmm. and, and stuff. I think we need a discussion um, uh, in, in total, you know, sort of like the wage bill debate we started a few uh, years ago and then it seems to have gone nowhere, mm -hmm. seems to have disappeared. I think we need to have a discussion. It's teachers, it's um, uh, doctors, lecturers, you know, now civil servants. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking of going to strike, nurses as well. You know, so um, there is, I think, a big problem with um, uh, how we approach our uh, uh, remunerating our public workers. You know, um, there's lots of disaffection. And mm -hmm. I think the government itself, I mean, should bear quite a lot of the blame because of the way it, the strategies it has employed in dealing with these people which are really disingenuous where they agree to increases and then they uh, uh, whatever draw back at the last minute you know precipitate all these strikes so mm -hmm. i think there's a deficit of credibility there um, uh, for government but as for the um, uh, the latest uh, uh, document, I haven't seen it. So All right, I mean, and what the SRC did is basically just increase salaries, especially for the uh, lowest earners, to about uh, 3,000, 4,000 shillings. But in that same report, uh, Susan, uh, it exposed as well uh, the very high allowances that a section of civil servants earn. And in some instances, allowances that account for up to 70, 80 percent of their gross income. I mean, and this is something Kenya is constantly complaining about the bulking wage bill it's too much we can't handle it and yet we have people who are getting allowances I mean I looked at that list those things like tent allowance I mean I don't even understand <laughs> why, uh, you know animal handler allowance I don't know what that is for but I mean what are your thoughts on that <coughs> just like Katara here I haven't seen it either mm -hmm. but just from your explanation I think uh, and seeing what is happening right now uh, my question will be whether it's the right time to even start discussing that mm -hmm. or whether we're trying to bring up that to try and suppress all these voices which are coming up. We're seeing lecturers on the street. We are seeing doctors. The issues have not been resolved yet. We're now even seeing the legislatures themselves again coming up and saying, unless you pay us $3 billion, we are going to do we are not going to pass the budget. Mm -hmm. We are at $3 billion, we are not going to do ABCD. So for me... Uh, Whereas SRC have got the, the constitutional mandate to, to help this country rationalize salaries because like those disparities, this is not new to us. These things have been there before and this was the more reason why even SRC, the drafters of the constitution thought of having such a commission so as to help rationalize salaries so that the lowest earning workers, you know, there's not that huge, you know, disparity between the lowest and the highest mm -hmm. earning. But again, over the years also, they have proved to disappoint because every time they bring out a salary review, it still reflects the same. So it, it defeats the purpose. <coughs> but I think the timing, because all these things are likely to be politicized. Mm -hmm. If someone else, be it in opposition or be it in government, picks it up, it's going to be seen as if this is likely to be. It's to be a just political another issue. political agenda. Right. So whereas the motive could be good, 
for us they, they could actually be coming in to try and arrest this situation because I don't know where we are headed. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we are remaining with six months to, to the new regime or to the new government coming to power. So if I were SRC, this requires some thoughts, mm -hmm. requires some study. And uh, it's not only here at the national, you know, government look at even the county level. We've had situations whereby a bodyguard to a governor earns more than what a doctor earns. Mm -hmm. And the doctor really has really invested a lot in, in his education. So there are several issues that need to be looked into. So I hope this is not just another political uh, answer to all these problems that you're facing. All right. I mean, Ahito, do you agree with Gadara and Susan that mm -hmm. this is not the right time? And do you think that this new structure would really work towards bridging that disparity between the highest and lowest paid uh, civil servants? Thank you, Michelle. My argument has always been that it's not about bridging the gap. Mm -hmm. The issue is we should look at our economy by what margin are we growing mm -hmm. and then look at our public servants. What are they earning? Is it uh, measuring up to the living standards? Uh, is it fair pay? Are uh, they worth earning what they uh, work for? Mm -hmm. Because this is taxpayers' money and it should be very fair and pegged on premises that is pegged on best practices mm -hmm. borrowed across the world. But we all have the problem of inflated allowances, people earning three times more than their basic salaries as allowances. Mm -hmm. Those are questionable things, if not um, uh, attempts to you know, uh, play graft into the salaries or packages that people take away. Mm -hmm. Why would you pay somebody who just travels from uh, Siaya County to Nairobi for an official duty some 40, 50,000 shillings mm -hmm. overnight, over and above buying him an air ticket. Those are questionable. That money is more needed on the ground to service the needs of the people, to supply water, to buy food and make roads for the people. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, right. I think, if I may, um, there the, are the, the two issues, I think. Um, uh, the last uh, um, time we had a, a, a wage debate that um, our mm -hmm. I think the first is that discrepancy between mm -hmm. the highest mm -hmm. and the lowest honors. And to a large extent, there was the idea that crisis was being created to essentially mask that. Um, I think the second thing is to remember that, on average, Kenyans earn about uh, uh, under 20,000 shillings, you know, the average Kenyan. He's being asked to pay his doctor 300,000, mm -hmm. his MP a million shillings, mm -hmm. you know, his civil servants. If you, if you speak about public officials like the president who earn 1.2, you know, uh, others earn up to 2 million. Mm -hmm. You know, all this is coming from the pocket of all this the guy who earns uh -huh. 10,000 bob. You know, and at some point we need to sit down and look at the bigger picture and to simply say, is it sustainable for us to keep paying mm -hmm. these guys these huge amounts of money? Mm -hmm. You know, relatively huge, let me say. Now, it's not to say that they don't deserve it, but that's the wrong uh, way to approach it. Is mm -hmm. whether we can actually afford it. Mm -hmm. And I like that you bring that in because uh, I'd like to bring in the issue of members of parliament who are now mm -hmm. asking for 3.3 billion shillings mm -hmm. uh, for eight months when they will not be working. Right. Now let's keep in mind that our members of parliament earn about 740,000 shillings a month on mm -hmm. top. I mean, they also have allowances and right. so come to slightly more than a million. Right. These are some of the highest paid members of parliament in, in the, the world, world. Mm. when it came to doctors pay and of course i know the cba is not just about pay right. but they uh -huh. said you know what kenyan doctors are you know among some of the highest paid in the world why do they need a salary increase <laughs> and they give uh, you know the pay structure of uganda and tanzania <laughs> right. just showing how yeah, much but they better, don't compare their own pay how much better they're being paid right. i mean yes yeah. and so now they're asking for this money yep. The country has no money to pay doctors. They still want money for eight yeah. months when they haven't worked. I mean, it's, it's, it is atrocious how our MPs uh, uh, carry on. Um, uh, just in December, they voted themselves uh, another five billion. That's on top of this 3.3 that they're asking for. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I think there's uh, an idea created amongst at least the higher echelons of society that their positions are essentially uh, places of, uh, of extraction. Mm -hmm. You know, that they get in, there's money for politicians. You know, there's no money for the rest mm -hmm. of us. And I think at some point we need to sit down as a society, you know, um, and have a, a really rational discussion. Mm -hmm. How much should we, can we actually afford to pay our public servants? Mm -hmm. And at, how do we prioritize them? Why should we pay an MCA more than we pay a doctor? 
you know, is it that an MCA is more important? What service does he give that is over and above, you know, uh, what a doctor gives? Mm -hmm. How do you actually justify a wage. And it can't simply be that MPs can hold us to hostage by saying we won't exactly. pass uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the budget and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we really need to go beyond that. I think this becomes a, 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 a constitutional issue in the sense that um, us, the, the people who constitute the state, you know, mm -hmm. constitutes the country need to step in and say this is not working for us. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, mm -hmm. And let's, let's actually have a proper rational discourse mm -hmm. that says that we're not just going to deal with this um, sort of piecemeal, let's talk to doctors, let's talk to MPs, you know, it's, it's, let's get them all together and let's say this is the rationale that we need to determine who actually earns what and right. on what basis. Mm -hmm. Let's get some uh, expertise on governance from Susan. I mean, 3.3 billion shillings in total, 6.7 million shillings each in, uh, in terms of gratuity. And this is eight months when they will not be working. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Should they be given that money to begin with? Of course, no. Of course, this is just an act of greedness. Mm -hmm. Because these MPs, whom do they represent? Do they represent their families there? No, they represent Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Kenyans have delegated their sovereign power to them in terms of legislation and say, you are our representative, you go there on our behalf. And the Kenyans also voted for the, con they put together some legal instruments in the name of the constitution that say, you are going to be there for five years. And those very MPs understand circumstances as per why. This country held 2013 election in March and not in August. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it would have been in August. MPs also understand very well that once you enter the office, once you've been sworn in, even if it's day one, and let's say by bad luck you die, that still becomes a term and you'll be paid the full, I mean, you, you can be paid the full benefits. But so the question is, when these MPs start saying that, oh, you need to pay us, because, you know, we are going to have eight months that we are going to work. It's one, they don't have confidence that the kind of structural arrangement that Kenyans have given them, saying you can be re-elected. They don't serve on terms like uh -huh. the president, like you can only go for two terms. They know that they have not performed well on the ground. They saw that sure they're not good. Of course, we know almost 70% <coughs> of them do not come back. So people are trying to look for some retirement benefit. But all we are saying, this is greed. And if this be the case, if the, the, the CES treasure is going to, you know, if the government is going to subdue to their pressure, then it means we have money. Why are we not paying the doctors? Uh -huh. Why are we not paying the lecturers? Why are we underestimating the pressure that can come from students all over this country who have now gone back to their homes and who are missing classes just because MPs who should be the people who should be intervening and come up with discussion and measures through which you can find way of paying these doctors and paying the lecturers, they are now saying first of all pay us. Mm -hmm. And believe me, Michelle, if you were to take there a bill that tries to increase the salaries of lecturers, salaries of MP and probably salaries of the, the doctors, these MPs will first of all vote for theirs anonymously. None of them <laughs> is going to disagree. And you know, we've seen them going around the country trying to urge people register and mass, come and register. And none of you media is telling us how many people are dying also mm -hmm. as a result of no medicine, no medical services. So I think this is greed. And I think this is where media, you fail us. There's no point of putting such thing as banner headline, mm -hmm. unless if you're putting it to condemn it, because this is outrightly greedness of the highest. Well, the members of parliament. I mean, Ohito, are we being too harsh on these members of parliament? Are they entitled to these eight months of pay? There are two ways to look at it. One, if you look at the decisions and judgments of uh, employment and labor relations court, mm -hmm. MPs are elected for a term of five years. Mm -hmm. If you terminate the services of such an individual before the actual calendar five years, then they're entitled to basic pay for the remainder of the period. It happens even in corporates, it happens in contractual arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, but the flip side of it is, why then would they draw allowances of car allowances and medical and blah, blah, for the period that they will not be using mm -hmm. cars? Right. Those are the <laughs> honest questions that we should be asking. But if you ask me, I am for the pay them for the remainder. In fact, we are tired of them. Pay them, let them just go mm -hmm. home. Yes. Uh, I and don't, I, I, yeah, it's a I good evidence. Pay them and get rid of them. No, yeah. no, not really. I don't, I don't agree with Ohito. There's no point. 
I mean, why would we pay MPs and we are not paying doctors? Which one is should come first? And and first of all, MPs yes, they're entitled in terms of contractual, you know, agreements with the employer. But listen, we've had attempts where they <coughs> they've tried to go there even to change. They have power to change the date of election to March next year. Yeah, why haven't you? Why haven't you? Well, yeah, but actually, you see, they can do it. Actually, haven't the, they the, done the, that? Uh, um, where I would disagree a little bit with what uh, uh, Ohito says, yes, it's true that a term is defined as that, uh, that five years. But um, when you talk about the contracts that they have, when these guys were elected in 2013, the Supreme Court had already ruled on when the 2017 election would Will be held. Yeah. You know, so they knew that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know about the, the, the reduced time frame, mm -hmm. you know. So it cannot be that they come back and they say, oh, we didn't know you have cut down, you've cut short our term. No, when you elected, that ruling was there, you know, by the Supreme Court. Uh -huh. And my point is this, is again, the, some of this goes beyond simply the, um, uh, the, the legalistic arguments of when does a term end ETC. These guys have an obligation, a duty to us. We actually allow them to go through our budgets you know, to decide what are our priorities, you know, uh, and stuff. And if their priorities themselves, you know, pay us first, and then we can talk about the budget, which is essentially what they're saying here, that if you don't pay us, we will throw it out. It doesn't matter the consequences to the rest of the public. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it's what she said, that um, these are not people who are there to represent Selfie. us. Mm -hmm. You know, they're already abdicating their duty to the public you know, and simply saying that, well, this is really about me, mm. you know, about what I earn over and about, you know, everything mm. else, nothing mm. else matters. Mm -hmm. And so I'm saying that as the people who essentially, who, who are supposed to own the country, I know mm. in reality it doesn't work out that way, you know, but we need to go beyond this and to say we need to have a serious constituent um, uh, assembly sort of uh, thing where we sit and we discuss and we say, how do we tame this? How do we get away from this situation, which happens almost every, uh, uh, every five years or every, every year, where they're constantly putting up uh, barriers to us being able to say, well, actually, mm -hmm. here's your remuneration, here's your job. Mm -hmm. Why do they get a car allowance? We fuel the cars, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. They get a house, I think they're the only guys who after one term are entitled to a pension, right? Exactly. You know, whoever gets a pension mm -hmm. after terms. five years' work. Mm -hmm. it's two terms, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know. My only it's other argument, my only other argument would be that um, let's peg this also on performance. Yeah. What are they elected to do? Let us look at the quality of legislation and representation mm -hmm. when they come to the house. Out of the 400 plus 468 MPs, I can hardly count 15 or 20 who have made valid arguments on the floors of the two houses. Uh, what are they elected for? What do they stand for? When they disappear from their constituencies for six, eight months without being seen, mm -hmm. you know, a senator has not been seen in some counties since the election time. He's only returning now to recap But it's campaign time. time. <laughs> so what does that mean? And this brings in what Alma said, yeah. you know, they know they have not performed, they know they will not be exactly. re-elected, so yeah. they need to, to, to begin for that money because they need to leave it something. Yeah, right, but, so but also, Michelle, mm -hmm. uh, uh, much as I agree with Ohito, uh, how do we measure their performance if not during the election, when they're seeking re-election? Because you see, even though the constitution had provided for recall clause, it is so what happened in the Leadership and Integrity Act. It was thoroughly <laughs> watered down one. <clears throat> you could not institute any recall measure before two years. So what are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Two years, someone is there. After two years, and, and there are several other processes that will make it difficult even for anybody to think of starting even in, in initiating such kind of a process. So they have done things to protect themselves. And sadly enough, with the kind of uh, our democracy, our, our, our governance system, it's very <coughs> hard. If they were like these other public servants or civil servants, you say sign performance contract. For them, with us, we sign with them a performance contract of five years. Uh -huh. And the only way we can sort them out, like right now, the country and all Kenyans are in the mood of election. They're saying, come 8th August, we want to score you. And this is what they're trying to say, pay us first, uh -huh. eh, so that you can score <laughs> us.
That's different. And of course, the other people saying pay us and make the uh, situation better is doctors. And it is now 66 days since the doctor's strike began. We've begun seeing a bit of hope and reprieve in the negotiations. Uh, as of yesterday, we've had doctors say they are willing to negotiate as long as the parties are negotiating with a reasonable. That's what they said. But of course, when they brought in uh, Court of Secretary General Francis Atwali, there was a lot of hope uh, that this being the number one trade unionist in the <laughs> continent, he will solve the situation. Uh, Gadara, do you really think this was pegged on that? Uh, 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 I'm not sure just bringing it at all is going to solve uh, uh, the problem. I think um, uh, the fact that the doctors have started softening up in a sense, mm -hmm. or at least, at least that's how it's portrayed, I think in their statement there's a lot to ask what they mean when they say reasonable, when they say the government should not be so hard mm -hmm. uh, uh, in its position and they're willing to negotiate, well, that means they're willing to go back to work. Um, and I, I think they kind of painted themselves in, into a corner. Um, the way I see the whole um, uh, discussion around the CBA, I think it's been really distorted by both sides. Mm -hmm. The government did sign an agreement you know, uh, that I think is beyond dispute. And mm -hmm. I think it was very disingenuous for them to come back and start saying that, no, it's not a valid agreement. It was signed by a demoted PS, mm -hmm. you know, ETC, to find <laughs> excuses. <laughs> Um, essentially for not living up to what they promised. But I think the doctors also at fault, uh, and I think on two, uh, on two grounds. Um, first, when they went to the courts, um, uh, in October they were given a ruling where they were told, I mean, uh, go negotiate a new CBA. The one you have is not valid. Mm -hmm. Go negotiate a new one. And if by January you haven't come to an agreement, then we will allow you to register the one that you already have. Mm -hmm. They chose not to follow that. You know, they chose to go on strike regardless. You know, <coughs> and I think that undermined their position. You know, I think now they'd have been in a much stronger position had they just waited till mm -hmm. January. Uh, anyway, we are where we are. The second thing has been the spin they are putting on the CBA. The CBA is being presented as a solution to Kenya's health problems, which it is not. It deals with doctors' welfare. And yes, doctors' welfare is an important part um, of a functioning health system, but it is not the solution to it. You know, it's just one bit. And we need to sort that out, but we need to have a wider discussion about the, the problems we have um, uh, with the health system, how it is structured, whether devolution is working, etc. Mm -hmm. You know, but all that is being elided by simply this focus on their welfare and this sort of spin that, oh, if you fix our welfare, you, won't, you suddenly won't need to fly to India. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, there will be hospitals sure. if CBA, I mean, there will be drugs in hospitals if the CBA is implemented or there will be mm -hmm. blood in the blood, blood banks. That's not going to happen. Right. You know, mm -hmm. the CBA doesn't cover that. It covers mm -hmm. the working conditions mm -hmm. of doctors. Mm -hmm. And while it is true that some of those conditions do affect you, they don't fix everything. Mm -hmm. We've got the Musimi uh, Task Force report. That was also negotiated at the behest of request of the KMPDU mm -hmm. or the issues they brought up in 2011. You know, that is a much more comprehensive document. And for me, it's, it's still a mystery why the KMPDU is not pushing mm. you know, for the implementation of the Musimi Task Force report because that would go a long way, much longer than the CBA, to mm -hmm. fix their problems. Mm -hmm. The final thing is um, uh, when uh, Oluga was interviewed on Citizen uh, <coughs> on December 6th. Um, uh, he clearly said, in fact, his, his word was categorically that this strike is not, you know, is not about patients suffering, it's about doctors suffering. That's what mm -hmm. he said. Mm -hmm. So now for them to try and spin it around and say, no, it's, it's about fixing uh, 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 conditions for patients, <coughs> Is disingenuous, uh -huh. you know, so right. and I think they need to be called out on that. I mean, I mean, Alma, after 66 days of having very hard stance positions, we will not accept nothing less than the original CBA. Doctors are now uh, softening, uh, softening up, like Gadara says. I mean, you know, were they just b between a, a rock and a hard place? There's no way out of this. I, I think I agree with Gadara that uh, it's not just about their welfare. When they started off, it was that uh, they would talk about their welfare and they will talk about the environment. And, mm. and I think this is what also made Kenyans to really be on their side because they would say, look, we go to the hospital, we have no gloves, there is no medicine, we human beings, you're seeing someone dying, honestly, you can't help. But also, I think the whole debate, the whole hidden agenda is, is that doctors were not quite in agreement. I, I don't think if they were 
really, really consulted when we were designing this devolution framework and deciding to fully devolve. Maybe the, the health sector, both personnel and, uh, and, and, the, and the standards and everything. I, I think probably doctors felt, and they, they made some attempts. They would have re remained at the national level. Mm -hmm. Because why? Like I just gave an example when we started this discussion. You find uh, who is supervising. We've had situations whereby a doctor is being supervised, I don't know, by a chairman, uh, an MCA who is a, a chairman, who is very much illiterate, I'm sorry to use that <laughs> word, <laughs> supervising and pretending that she can also go to the hospital and ask a doctor, why are you not treating people? Mm -hmm. Why are you not doing ABCD? And we had a, a case sometime back when we were doing the socioeconomic audit of the constitution of which I was a member. And we went around uh, the country listening to various views. And the most interesting one, <coughs> where you will say we still have challenges with uh, fully devolved function, especially health, was in terms of supervisory, whereby this MCA do not really understand what is supervision. And in, in one county, uh, there was a, a CEC who told us that actually an MCA went to slap a doctor. Mm -hmm. You can imagine an MCA slapping you in the name of I'm supervising you. Why are you not at your workstation? So such kind of things are not really good. But also, I think in this country, all of us, like the Bible say, we have sinned mm -hmm. and we have fallen short of glory. <laughs> I think we put our interest first before everybody else. And uh, if we, there was a study that uh, was conducted some time back about uh, how much it takes actually to educate a doctor. And to be honest, the doctors are the most costly. And in that study, I, I don't know if it was by internews or something, that agency, it was saying to educate a doctor, it, it was released in 2013, you need five million shillings to attain the first basic degree. Then after that, I think the government pays for them almost three quarters when they're doing their masters and such. So uh, you can imagine how much money the government spends on these people. So I, I think as much as they are negotiating, they also need to take into consideration this is what is being spent on us, and we have a duty as Kenyans. First of all, the duty as Kenyans also to try and say, and I think that's why they've so softened their, their stance. However, with these new demands of MPs wanting to be paid, <laughs> it shows there is money. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's the biggest the situation. Original. If yeah. there's money for doctors and there's, uh, there's money the for politicians, FM, there should be money there's money for doctors. For doctors. But yeah. I mean, this whole issue of uh, devolution has uh, brought a lot of issues in the health sector. Uh, a lot of people have praised the devolution as the best thing that could have happened to the country. But is it so for the health sector? There are two ways to look at it. Mm -hmm. I'll give the case of Mandera County, where I visited a dozen times where there were no functional hospitals that were they are now working, mm -hmm. where there were no renovations or investment in terms of health in infrastructure, there are. Where there was never an ambulance, now there are. Where there were never drugs stored anywhere in any of the dispensaries and health centers, now there are. But if you look at the services in Mandela County, they have improved, I think, 400, 500 percent times. Mm -hmm. In the marginalized counties, mm -hmm. there has been immense success in terms of health services rolled out All to right. the people. The only challenge is like, how do you get a doctor who is from up country mm -hmm. to serve there without being attacked by the militias mm -hmm. and so on. But when you look at other counties, instead of the services going better, they have worsened. Um, and then there's the argument of uh, the equipment which was being bought by a central government and being forced on the throats of the county mm. government. Uh, you bring in very expensive MRI machines, very skill sets um, uh, which are required, you cannot even operate those machines. So you have these things brought to the counties, there are no skills that can mm. operate them. Mm -hmm. So. In a nutshell, you just wasted public funds by bringing this uh, 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 equipment, which needs specialized training to mm -hmm. operate. Mm -hmm. So that is, in itself is also a big challenge. But I fault doctors that I think they must have gone to sleep when the evolution was. They were busy making their money in their consultancies. Actually, they tried. <laughs> and they did get to do. I think mm -hmm. teachers were very wise in this, that no. 
not 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 MCAs will decide how we work. Mm -hmm. Not governors who have never held office will decide how we work and they remain oh, so national. Mm -hmm. But doctors are well meaning. But when you send a doctor and you don't give him gloves, you don't give him the right now uh, drugs he has requisitioned for, and you expect him to improve the health services and how he treats people, then you're asking, you know, too much mm -hmm. from them. But that, is, is that the point? That, um, uh, if you send a doctor, mm -hmm. there's a system that's supposed to provide sure. all mm -hmm. these other mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And simply paying him more won't make gloves appear. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, and stuff. So we need to think beyond that. I think sure. well, some of the things that uh, Oito has said about the, the differences within counties, I mean, um, uh, uh, are symptomatic of the fact that we, we devolve without a rational basis for it, without mm -hmm. actually thinking through, you mm -hmm. know, the effects it would have. Mm -hmm. And also what we call devolution is sometimes uh, a bit strange because the doctors, for example, say they are not employees of the county government. Mm -hmm. That's why till today they're negotiating with the national government. In fact, they say they are, they, I mean, when mm -hmm. I spoke seconded, to yeah. a bunch of them that they're seconded mm -hmm. to, to the county government, mm -hmm. you know. So in what sense then is that aspect at least of uh, a personnel devolved? Mm -hmm. You know, it seems mm -hmm. to me it's not really devolved, but mm -hmm. it's talked about as if it is. Mm -hmm. so you have counties talking about, oh, we are going to hire uh, doctors, oh, or doctors. we've hired doctors, or we pay doctors. But if they're given this money by national government, mm -hmm. which seconds them, the doctors, you know, so the doctors actually don't have contracts with county governments, they have it with national government, mm -hmm. you know, then that's not a devolved function. Mm -hmm. you know, we haven't yet devolved. I think we need also to think about how these services manifest, you know, across counties. Mm -hmm. If you go to Makueni today, uh, the governor has introduced a universal um, uh, uh, health, uh, 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 health yeah. system, mm -hmm. you know, where it's supposedly any resident can go into a hospital, mm -hmm. you know, and not have to pay upfront um, uh, for the service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how can that be just in Makweni? What stops people from Machakos going across to get that service mm -hmm. there? You know, is there anything? And if that model seems to work, I must you, I don't know, but it would be nice to study it, but if it works, is it something we should replicate? When counties start to sit back and they say, let's buy ambulances, and a lot of these guys do it, a lot of the governors do it as a mm. PR function. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no rationalization. So Mutua went and bought 70 ambulances, which spent most of their time parked, you know, because they couldn't go anywhere. Um, uh, we've got people getting mobile clinics, uh, from, uh, especially from beyond zero, mm -hmm. that then stay they parked stay. because they don't have the, the, the resources, ETC, to keep them running. You know, the counties mm -hmm. don't. I know it's the same thing you're talking about with this uh, 38 billion equipment mm -hmm. uh, uh, they yeah, were given. Matter. There is no rational basis, you know. It's all either about the tender, it's all, uh, yeah. uh, you know, about, you know, you know, what it looks like. In um, fact, we need a real uh, rational you know, there was a doctor friend I was speaking to from Machakos who said after the ambulances were bought, the ambulances ended up bringing people to Nairobi because the hospitals in Machakos right. could not cater for these Precisely. people. Precisely. So, so the question was, I mean, priorities. I, I, I mean, we saw pictures but that's of when them you have, tents. That, That's where <laughs> does the decision lie? The decision to buy an ambulance is made by MCAs and the governor uh -huh. who are not competent in medical field. Neither do they have genuine, honest advisors on health issues. So okay. for them, mm -hmm. we need 15 ambulances. My wife or my nephew going to supply. We're going to make a kickback there. And that's how we, we operate. Mm -hmm. right. Ask yourself, show me the first governor who has been admitted in a county hospital. And then you give me one. <laughs> or even a Kenyan <laughs> hospital. Uh, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, Kenyan hospitals, they go to Nairobi hospital. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so th those are the big questions. Why should Governor Ruto, with all the billions he gets, Isaac Ruto, fly to South Africa for the checkup of, um, you know, a bump <laughs> from a tear gas canister? Mm -hmm. Those are the questions. If I became governor today, I would first go to a hospital mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that you inspire public confidence. And the same to the national government. Why would our cabinet secretaries fly to Europe, South Africa? Why would a former president fly to South Africa for a checkup? Mm -hmm. These are questions we must address as a country. Yeah, but I think, I think uh, okay. let's, let's yeah, hear from over. From yeah, Michelle, I actually does the disease because I come from a county where we had so many ambulances, and even today, to date, if you want to give a perfect example where health as a fully devolved function has failed, 
you will always cite my my county, mm -hmm. which, which is county Busia is County. Let's hear <laughs> because one, and especially in my sub county, we've had two incidences of death which have occurred. A lady um, who in labor and went to this uh, health center. Uh, there is a, an ambulance parked there, and she had she had a referral, and then the driver say, "Pay me bribe." The lady died there. But the driver of the ambulance wanted to be bribed. wanted a bribe, a, a bribe of a thousand, and this lady didn't have. So the lady died there. The relatives watched her dying there. That has been one case. <coughs> Another case was also of this lady who had twins. Or actually, she had triplets, and also she had a referral. Same, same hospital. And the driver say, oh, I don't know, uh, I'm on duty, I have to drop, I don't know, I've been instructed to drop so and so somewhere I'll, to see I, I'll come back. And this lady lost. You have an ambulance driver telling you I'll come back. <laughs> and, an ambulance driver. And some will say we don't have fuel. So the whole essence is all these things were bought and they agree for kickbacks, 10%. You see the ambulances roaming all over. And that's why, to some extent, you tend to listen to the doctors. Mm -hmm. I mean, was that really the priority? All right. That was right. not the priority. So it, it's, it's, I think yeah. in, the, in the end, it, you, we've got to rationalize mm -hmm. how the system works. We've got to really think about it at a much deeper level than simply saying remunerate or devolve. These are mm -hmm. just terms. But mm -hmm. what do they mean? Do, do counties have the capacities to actually run health care? You know, do they have the knowledge base? Mm. Do they have the advisors, etc.? Mm. It simply doesn't make sense to say, you know, give it to them and then they'll figure it out. You know, we've got to be quite deliberate, much more deliberate about how we go about it, especially mm. with uh, things like health, you know, which are much more, I think, uh, impact uh, your mm. ordinary everyday Kenyan in mm -hmm. a very um, uh, 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 immediate way. Got to be much more deliberative about how we go about structuring the systems that are supposed to provide mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. And we've got to think not just in terms of pay for guys, but also in terms of how the systems themselves mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. you know, and how then, when we are paying doctors, uh, or when, when the, the, the demand be paid one, two, three, how that, that fits in into both our financing of health. Don't forget, we've never hit our budget targets, um, uh, which is supposed to be 15% of mm. uh, our national spend should be on health. Mm. We've never hit that. That is not part of the discussion we're mm -hmm. having. Mm -hmm. you know. So um, uh, let's widen the scope of this discourse. We are actually talking of fixing the health system. Mm -hmm. It's not the CBA. You know, it's something else. And I'll say one final thing. It's not that I'm against the doctor striking or asking for better pay. It's that what I'm against is the spin that if we pay doctors better, we will get better service. We've seen this with MPs, paying them better has never resulted in better representation. <laughs> you know, if anything, they keep taking more. All right. You know? <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's focus on another report that was released earlier this week. Uh, uh, this is talking about, about the number of Kenyans in foreign jails. And this report says about 186 Kenyans are locked up in foreign jails. This is just the number that... Has, report, has been reported, the number that is documented. And uh, according to this report, uh, families of these Kenyans say they've gotten no help at all from the Foreign Affairs Office. They keep getting false promises, and there's just no intervention by the Kenyan government. And I mean, Ohito, the question here would be, what in this situation is the Kenyan government supposed to do, first of all? Well, Kenya has uh, what I'd call international relations and bilateral relations with various countries and uh, we are uh, part of other international instruments that uh, guide relationship between countries. Um, I don't know the 186 how they have been profiled, um, whether they are criminal cases or mm -hmm. the civil cases, that's a different argument. Mm -hmm. um, what would be important is that um, what is the decision or the desire of these Kenyans in jail? Would they want to serve their jail terms in those particular countries? Um, what would be the cost of bringing them back here? Uh, if they came back, if there were criminal, mm -hmm. uh, criminal cases, uh, mm -hmm. how do we treat them when they come mm -hmm. here? We also proceed with the same cases. Um, there have been cases of uh, this week of Kenyans who were extradited to the US. Right. Those are begging questions that we mm -hmm. really need to sit down and address. There was the, uh, the Ichi case of ICC, where we had very high profile Kenyans, you know, mm -hmm. um, being tried before an international court. Those are questions that we have to agree with. Does it mean that our justice system is 
uh, has got hold? Do we have trust and confidence in it? So uh, uh, for me, uh, I think if you are in jail in the U.S. versus committee, you know, the better option. Right. <laughs> for me, uh, for Susan, me, just before you speak, uh, mm -hmm. let's take, take a case in point of the five Kenyans who've been uh, being held in South Sudan for quite a long time. It's been a very uh, long time, about two or so years. And... Uh, the South Sudanese authorities say there's just no commitment and no intervention from the Kenyan government. It's just the families that we're dealing with, and that's not how international relations work. And so these guys will stay here until the Kenyan government shows the will. I think, uh, let me start by also asking the flip side of the story. Uh -huh. How many foreigners are we holding here? Uh -huh. I would wish when that story came up, the media also to find out. Because the other time, I think it was sometime last year, there was some feature which was being done of uh, Langata women, you know, prison, and you could see several foreigners mm. there. So the question is, how many are we also holding here? How many South Sudanese are we also holding here? Because it's usually a, a question of negotiating. Uh, you could be holding them maybe due to different crime, and I'm sure probably we have some of them who are here. And in this country, justice, I think, is very much unfair, is very much selective. When we had this case in ICC, you saw the whole world out of Kenya going there and spending. Most of them were spending public funds. How come we are not able to help even if, even if they are five? Why couldn't we be like Israel who say, you get one of, of our own, we get a hundred of yours. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have such kind of a policy. So it's, it's a whole question of what is our foreign policy? What do we consider to be a priority to us? Is our law really focused on having only the mighty? The other day you saw even the UN thing when one, uh, that person was, I don't know, the, the commander or whatever, was, <coughs> you know, was removed and Kenya reacted so fast and said, Fine, if that's the case, we are withdrawing our, our troops. Our troops. Right. Uh, and, and so this one is a reflection of the disparities which we have in Kenya, which sadly enough, they have also encroached our justice system. But the whole sense is that when it comes to issues of foreign policy, the onus is on the president. The onus is on the head of state because that is, that is his purview. He has the discretion to negotiate with the head of state on the other side and say, even as we do not condemn such a crime, we can be able to do it to, to, to hold him, them here at home. So I think the media also sleeping on your job. Mm -hmm. Tell us how many <laughs> foreigners how many South Sudanese we have in our jail? Um, I, uh, well, I mean, as we speak, there are two South Sudanese, I understand, who are missing right. uh, in the country. <laughs> South Sudan itself yeah, is don't asking Kenyan we, authorities yeah, to I mean, produce uh, them. Yeah, we, we, our government has behaved quite atrocious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, the two South Sudanese you, you speak of mm -hmm. um, uh, are suspected to have been taken <laughs> by government agents and mm -hmm. to be de uh, uh, mm -hmm. with a view to uh, extraditing them back to South Sudan. Mm -hmm. We know. Uh, of cases, in fact, linked to the the, the, the five guys we have um, in South Sudan, mm -hmm. we know people who've been abducted here mm -hmm. with the help of national uh, 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 um, uh, the national government uh, resource mm -hmm. and taken to to Sudan. We mm -hmm. know of Kenyans mm -hmm. who've been uh, renditioned essentially to Uganda um, uh, over the, uh, the, the the July 7 bombing, I think it was. Um, so, I mean, our government has behaved badly. Uh, and then secondly, remember Duale's statement um, uh, uh, during the height of the whole fury over the ICC that they will never allow any Kenyan to mm -hmm. be subject to a foreign court. Well, mm -hmm. it seems it's only two Kenyans that two they were Kenyans. talking about. Mm -hmm. you know? And once those two were done with, it all disappeared. <laughs> when Amina Mohammed was going and Kenyans. wailing at the uh, ASP, you know, uh, you know should it, Kenyans should it be subject to this, going to the UN, to the AU. Mm. She cannot go to Juba, mm. you know, to talk on behalf of our guys. Mm -hmm. She cannot go to Kampala mm. to talk about, uh, 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 about our people there, mm. you know, who've been taken illegally. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, in the case of the ones in Uganda, they were extradited illegally. The Ugandan court accepted that they were in front of it uh, mm -hmm. illegally, but they say it's not their job to enforce Kenyan law. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, similarly, with the people in Sudan, if you read about the case, it's atrocious how it's been carried on. Again, nothing. You know, She goes to Juba to negotiate peace process, mm -hmm. doesn't speak about our Kenyans. You know, and that's my point, is I think we have a system that is geared to helping only a few, you know, 
the same way we have money to pay MPs and not doctors, mm -hmm. we've got consular <laughs> services for the high and mighty when they get into trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. we can send all these diplomats to go fight and their case. MPs. But the ordinary Kenyan, you know, if you are abroad and something happens to you, it's very hard to get your ambassador. Very to come unfortunate. In. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I mean, you don't have a you know, her direct thing. number, sure. and that's it. Yeah, All precisely. Right. If so, you're not uh, her, her friend, you're not her boss, <laughs> then, even, you know, you're done. Could have, you could have her number or his number, but they will never. <laughs> oh, who are you? Who are you? you? Know, yeah, precisely. You know. Mm -hmm. All right, guys, so let's focus on one final story, and this is uh, a bit of politics now, uh, just before we wind up. And this week we've seen several defections, uh, a, a, you know, within politics, between Jubilee, uh, as well as Quad. And uh, just before we continue, let's listen in to Lenny Kivuti, one of the latest defectors, on what he had to say on his defection. My leaving Jubilee has nothing to do with one individual. It's a question of systems. If you're in a system that you feel you are not comfortable, you don't just quit. You try and correct it. I don't think I have the capacity and the power to correct Jubilee. Those who so, uh -huh. so what I did, I threw the back to the people who elect me. Everybody feels their governor, aspiring governor, should not remain in Jubilee, should go to another party. Actually, they did not say which other party. Most of them were saying, go independent, go to uh, PNU, go to Nake Nyangot. But the, all of them said they don't want me to go to ODM or NASA. Hii chama yetu ya maendeleo chap chap haiko ndani ya jubilee na haiko ndani ya NASA, iko ndani ya roo ya wanainchi. Sobu wanainchi wanataka maendeleo. But it is very clear we are not uh, fielding any presidential candidate. But our candidate of choice is President Uhuru Kenyatta. All right, uh, Lenny Kivuti there decamping from Jubilee to the Mandeleo Chap Chap Party. And let's get uh, the final comments from our panelists in studio this morning. Uh, Ohito, a lot of this has been pegged on the upcoming party primaries. Everybody trying helter skelter to see where they'll get a direct nomination. What are your thoughts on that defection? <laughs> Typical Kenyan politician who stands for nothing. Um, Kivuti, when did he start feeling uncomfortable, you know? It's been four years plus, so uh, was it the last two months when the new uh, Jubilee party was created? Uh, those are just questions, but uh, it's a signal that the house of Jubilee is on fire and there's much more boi boiling in the pot. It's just one of them, we're going to see many. All right, all right, Alma, very quickly, final comment. Yeah, you know, it's it's... It was actually expected, and this is just the beginning. We are going to, to experience this until up to about May there, uh -huh. when we have the final list of uh, nominees from parties that are going to IBC. But also, it's not only people defecting from uh, Jubilee to Chap Chap. We saw even in Narok defecting from Jubilee to ODM. Mm -hmm. and, and this one brings me to the question. When new media come uh, talking, when you're analyzing about the voter registration, the numbers, and they keep on saying, Horus region, Raila's region, Jubilee, uh. NASA, Cody's region, you're wrong. Because you're likely, you, you can't be certain with all these mass defections. You can't be certain. Whose region Rift is Valley, Rift Valley is being seen as Jubilee's region. Uh -huh. And yet, see what is happening in Kajiado, Narok. It's likely to go the other side. Okay. So this is what we call tectonic plates now, the, this tectonic movement. But again, this has been caused by the, w when they came up with that law in Parliament of party hopping, you know, they didn't know that this law was uh, a double sword, was also going to cut them, also to downsize them. So we are likely to see all this thing happen. All right, all right, in the run of the elections, of course, and it is exactly, uh, is it six months now to the August 8th general election? We're keeping an eye on the situation as it unfolds. This is our newsroom chat. We have been speaking to outgoing standard digital editor David Ohito, governance expert Susan Uma, and cartoonist and communication strategist Patrick Gadara here in studio. And that conversation brings us to a break here on Morning Express. For those on KTN Home, remember Life and Style is coming up next. For those on KTN News, our top stories 